I'm Steve Wallace. I currently work as a part-time charter pilot and an aviation safety consultant. Um, when the Columbia crashed on February 1st, 2003, I was, I was at that time the director of the Office of Accident Investigation at the Federal Aviation Administration. And in that position, I was on the NASA, what was then called the Space Shuttle Mishap Interagency Investigation Board. When the accident occurred, I was uh, playing tennis. It was Saturday. I was playing tennis at the McLean Racket and Health Club, and uh, uh, my wife called the club to say they had lost communication with the space shuttle. She had seen that on the news, so I left the tennis court, and immediately I received a call uh, from the FAA administrator. Then it was Marion Blakey, and on the call was the associate administrator for safety, uh, who I reported to directly, Nick Sabatini. And, um, the administrator was asking me, uh, and she had been in touch with the NTSB as well, about what we could do to help NASA. Well, they did not know that uh, neither she nor my immediate boss, who had just started in that position, uh, that I was on this contingency plan. So I explained that and um, that I expected they would activate it. Um, I went home, and shortly after that, I received a phone call from uh, the deputy NASA administrator, uh, Fred Gregory, and uh, saying they would they were activating the plan, and would I be available to serve? And I said, absolutely. They arranged for transportation. It was actually in an FAA aircraft. The FAA at that time uh, shared its aircraft with NASA, and uh, we were in an FAA aircraft from, we departed uh, on Sunday, the day after the accident, um, from Reagan Airport. I think Jim Halleck may have been on the plane with me, and, and there were some NASA people as well, maybe Brian O'Connor, I'm not sure. But uh, um, we went down to, uh, Norfolk, Virginia Beach area, Norfolk, I think is where we landed and picked up Admiral Turcott and Admiral Gaiman. Um, and then we went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We picked up uh, uh, General Barry there. Actually, there was something that I was touched by when there was, a, I think, a three-star general when we were pulling out from, uh, um, from Wright-Pat, and, you know, I didn't have much exposure to the military. and. There was a red carpet there up to the air stair, and, and as soon as they started the engines, the, the general saluted, and he held the salute until we taxied away. And it was probably a, you know, it was, I think, a, a military gesture recognizing the importance of what we were going to do. So uh, Admiral Gaiman had us sit around the table in the Gulfstream uh, jet and just asked us all our thoughts on how we should conduct the investigation. None of us were experienced. Um, particularly in spaceflight, although General Barry had served on the staff of the uh, Challenger investigation, he was probably, he, he was ahead of the rest of us in that regard. But Admiral Gaiman was more interested in uh, the military and the civilian approaches to accident investigation and just had a general conversation, getting our ideas and, and clearly listening to us. And, and um, something I, I always, uh, I admired from day one about Admiral Gaiman, he was clearly listening to you and uh, you knew that because he would repeat back something you had said, you know, three days later he would repeat it back and credit, credit you with having said it. And uh, really a very, um, a very good listener. I participated in one training exercise where I went down to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Jim Halleck was along. He was on that exercise as well. And it, in, the scenario was a transatlantic abort. The airplane landed in uh, Morocco or someplace, and there was a, uh, issues about toxic fuel spills or whatever. But um, was it adequate? I think that for uh, this kind of training is uh, you, you do the best you can. It's, it's never going to be uh, completely adequate because you, ju you just don't know exactly what the circumstances of the event that h might occur uh, will be. So it was worthwhile. Uh, it was a very small fraction uh, uh, of knowledge compared to what we learned when we just immersed into this seven-day-a-week exercise with the CABE. I think that um, the kind of Space Shuttle 101 or whatever the equivalent is for, the, for, for what you're training for is, is valuable. Um, I, I would say on balance the focus was um, 
perhaps too much on the technical aspects as compared to the, the real organizational challenges and, you know, the things that we, that the real challenges that face the CAVE early on and where the clamor, the clamor for an independent c congressionally mandated or presidential commission and are, is this really sufficiently independent from NASA? So those sort of uh, issues um, need to be addressed as well. And then at some level you have to recognize that there's going to be a level of make it up as you go, no matter how well you plan. Um, you just don't know what all the circumstances will be, the technical circumstances, the, the political, the public interest. So uh, you have to recognize that any contingency plan is your best effort. It's not going to be the entire answer when the event occurs. The need for uh, the investigation, the CABE, and I think this carries forward to any similar investigation, to demonstrate uh, real independence. Obviously, this is the core concept behind the NTSB investigating uh, aircraft accidents uh, as the lead. Um, and uh, a, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a important principle, and it was a huge issue at the beginning of this investigation. Um, several things were done to address it. Admiral Gaiman testified in Congress, and I think he fairly assertively uh, demonstrated his um, uh, independence from uh, NASA and including taking steps like uh, removing people from assisting the board who were involved in the mission, particularly maybe uh, Brian O'Connor, uh, people that we, he had the highest respect for, and then bringing in some people who were not on NASA's contingency plan but really respected people with also a level of marquee value, Sally Ride, Sheila. Uh, Widnall, uh, Doug Oshroff, Nobel laureate, and uh, then, then later, later John Logston, and these people weren't on the contingency plan. They were uh, they were added later, and all made made huge contributions. But particularly, uh, you know, his testimony uh, in Congress, I think, was quite convincing that this was going to be independent of NASA. I came to the CABE without a, a huge amount of accident investigation experience. It may seem odd that I say that since I had been for many years, the, uh, or about three at that time, the director of accident investigation for the FAA. But, you know, I was a lawyer by training. I worked in aircraft certification. I did international work. I had a varied career. And by the time I got into uh, accident investigation, I was in there at the executive level, running the whole office, making sure that the uh, investigators, you know, had their equipment and resources they needed, uh, uh, doing media and high-level government briefings so that they could go out and figure out why the accident happened. So I was not really a technically strong invest. I couldn't go look at a heap of rubble and tell you what happened. Uh, and some of the board members had more experience in that, and we just brought in uh, a big cadre of investigators um, from the military and the civilian uh, sides to to strengthen that that kind of hands-on uh, technical investigative uh, you know experience level. The, the, the lesson there is that uh, while the board members uh, actually physically wrote large amounts of the report, probably probably as maybe that's different from what happened with the Rogers Commission. Um, I think. Uh, they had a they had a leadership function in each of the each of the four groups, and effectively discharging that was uh, probably more important than finding the technical answers themselves. Going back to the the day that I met Admiral Gaiman on, on the on the aircraft going to Barksdale, he we were casually dressed. He uh, came out to the airplane wearing a dark business suit and a tie. And he said, the reason I've dressed like this is that we might encounter the press. And if we do, I will take care of them. I will tell them we're here, we have a job to do, leave us alone. Um, that, that was, he said words cl close, closely to exactly, close to exactly that uh, on, on day one. He rapidly became very much more sophisticated and extremely good at media relations, realizing that this was a, a, a national tragedy of epic proportions. There was a huge amount of public and political interest, and he then started scheduling regular press conferences. And he wanted some help, independent of NASA, particularly in this area, and I suggested uh, Laura Brown, the lead career uh, communications public affairs person at the Federal Aviation Administration at that time, and, and she came and joined the investigation 
Um, I remember he came and asked me what her background was. I said she was the captain of the Harvard sailing team, and he said, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> and, uh, and she'd been a reporter. So she did a very good job. I mean, he commented that she was the best. Uh, he had been in the military, he'd been in the private sector, he'd been in the government, and she was the best media person he knew he'd ever seen. So He uh, quickly came to understand the importance of uh, good media relations and having an independent uh, media lead person, uh, independent from, from NASA. And then as far as uh, press uh, events, uh, press conferences, we actually shared them. There, there were 13 members of the board and we would take turns. We wouldn't all go at once. You wouldn't have 13 people respond. Maybe, maybe have three or four or something like that. So we, we rotated that duty and, it, uh, and, you know, I think it came naturally to some of the board members better than others, uh, probably based on their, on their background and experience. But uh, I think we, uh, on balance, uh, did that very well. I think it's been, the investigation has been recognized for good media relations. I brought a few people in from the FAA, including uh, one investigator from the Office of Acts Investigation, Dan Diggins. Uh, he's a, he was a pilot and air traffic controller, uh, broad aviation background. And he really dug into the decision making on the mission management team. And he did a very good job of dissecting um, e everything from emails to recorded, tape recorded meetings and briefings, and really. Uh, painted at the end of the day a very clear picture of, of some of the communication issues and, and there were some very serious ones in that investigation including things like um, uh, say a GS-14 briefing a senior executive and the senior executive clearly um, indicating what the expected response is so, you know, so can't we say there isn't a safety of flight issue here that that sort of that sort of thing where you can see this is, this is uh, uh, it's, it's like the person who's supposed to be receiving the briefing is giving the briefing. That was, that was some of the most troubling um, evidence that we uh, unearthed in the investigation. I, I, I think uh, what that part of the investigation on the MMT demonstrated was, uh, uh, one, the need for thoroughness. It's like, it's like police work that finally catches the criminal just by relentless thoroughness. And so what did, uh, what did the investigators do? Well, they, they looked at emails, they listened to recordings of briefings, and they extensively uh, interviewed people and went back and re-interviewed several of them uh, and, and, and until they had that picture down. So it, it was very, very thorough, and uh, I think that was just coupled with um, uh, very good uh, analytical work. Um, we even brought in outside experts on communications, things about like, you know, using PowerPoint slides uh, instead of uh, more rigorous engineering analysis to resolve certain questions and issues, things like that. The recommendations going to be are, are kind of in two groups. The return to flight recommendations, and those really are focused more on the physical cause of the accident, prevent this from happening again, or improve your ability to survive if it does. Um, and then the what we call the continuing to fly recommendations, or the longer term ones, those really uh, were drawn mostly from the organizational issues. So, um, so some of the uh, return to flight recommendations included things like. Um, uh, reducing the likelihood of any debris shedding and hitting the orbiter, increasing the orbiter's ability to withstand it, uh, being uh, imp increasing, improving the ability to uh, detect it through an inspection at station emissions through much better uh, video on the launch. We, we saw all that when, when, when the return to flight occurred. And then uh, in inspection and repair capability that had to do with your ability to survive uh, damage to the, to the orbiter. My recollection is that some of those recommendations were uh, were issued uh, uh, when we completely agreed on them, but in advance of the issuance of the final report. And we were never secretive about where our thinking was going. We would have high-level meetings with NASA just to be open about that. So, so the report um, didn't contain a lot of surprises, I don't think. Uh, 
there's been a, a, a paradigm shift in the way we um, try to improve safety in commercial aviation, and, and noting that we fly 32,000 scheduled flights a day in this country. It's actually relative to space flight. It's an incredibly low risk uh, activity. So if we look at the accident rate, and we measured it, it's measured by the FAA now in terms of how many people die per 100 million carried, and that number was 1,400 after the end of World War II, if we sort of commercial aviation sort of dates from the end of World War II. And, and by the mid-50s, that number was down to about 500. By the 90s, it was down to about 50. And if you average the last five years, it's probably well under one in 100 million people. So how did we do that? Um, First, a series of technical advances. Airplanes that could fly above the weather, universal radar coverage, highly reliable, more powerful jet engines, things like that, um, sophisticated navigation systems. Then the next level, that got us way down from 1,400 to say 500. Or 50. The next thing, devices that trap human errors and prevented, prevented those errors not from happening, but from having ca catastrophic consequences. So ground proximity warning systems. We used to have airplanes fly into terrain, water, hit, hit antennas, things like that, way more frequently than we do now. Ground proximity warning systems that m modern ones have a map of the entire world and every radio antenna, and their w warnings are provided to a crew. Collision avoidance systems, again, they shouldn't be necessary if uh, the humans don't make a mistake, but the humans do make mistakes, and these devices trap the errors, stop them from being catastrophic. Um, how do we do even better? We, uh, well, uh, of course, constantly we've improved training constantly as well. Full motion visual simulators, tremendous uh, training aid. So now the focus in civil aviation is entirely on doing a better job of maximizing the learning from precursor events before accidents, because we have so few accidents. Anything that could have been an accident. You know, the airplane doesn't go off the runway into the ocean. The airplane goes off the runway by five feet into the overrun area, no harm done. But what's to be learned from that? So that lesson is, is critical in, I think, any, any endeavor to, any effort to, to improve safety, certainly in a high-risk area like space flight as well. So we were lucky in the CABE to uh, be fairly unconstrained on, on resources. In, in the civil sector, you know, accidents, you might go for a couple of years without an accident, then have an accident that's extremely costly if you have to retrieve uh, an aircraft uh, that's scattered at the bottom of the ocean. So th those things are very expensive, so that's an issue that civilian agencies have to deal with. Uh, the CABE was a, it was a huge, uh, you, know, you know, it was an epic disaster, I mean, from a national perspective. And, and so um, we were quite uh, un unconstrained, which was important uh, because uh, we dealt with some highly technically specialized areas like orbital reentry mechanics and, and things like that. And so Admiral Gaiman, I mean, our, our, the, the members get together and say, okay, who, who's the best expert we, we can bring in to, to question about this? And we would just go find that person and get them. Some of them were, were very expensive. Um, and so uh, we conducted tests, you know, we shattered a reinforced carbon, carbon panel. Th 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 these tests are expensive, these components are expensive. But um, being extremely well resourced uh, uh, helped us tremendously. And that's, a, that's an enviable position for any accident investigation to, to be in. So I'd like to talk about Admiral Gaiman's leadership. I, I think that his selection was just a, a stroke of genius, who's, who, who's ever it <laughs> was, Sean O'Keefe, Fred Gregory, but, but uh, really I have never enjoyed working for a, a leader as much as, as Admiral Gaiman. And um, uh, I talked about what a good listener he was, and he really was, he was a very open-minded and, and collaborative uh, type of guy, and he also knew uh, uh, what was important and what wasn't a, a, a kind of amusing anecdote was quickly uh, after we, we started at Barksdale, we quickly decided we needed to go to Houston and uh, office space was located. And we went to visit, we arrived in the evening and we went to visit the office space and the Admiral had a, a floor plan. 
and he had uh, you know 13 board members ultimately to deal with. Some of them had substantial uh, egos or high-ranking positions that came with beautiful offices, and he just we all walked through this building, and he just pointed to each office space and said, "That's where you're going, and that's where you're going," and there was not going to be any discussion about it. And I thought and he's he's been in enough situations to know that people get a little ego on the line about my office is bigger than yours, and he was not going to have any of it. So everybody just saluted and went in their little space, and we carried on from there. So that was, uh, I, I found that whole exercise uh, fairly amusing. But uh, really more seriously, Gaiman was uh, an uh, easygoing, open-minded, but uh, quietly very forceful when he, when he needed to be. And I, I heard him speak recently, and he talked about, and I hadn't really realized this, he, that he, he came in with a concern about getting it wrong. He didn't want to get it wrong. And he, touched, he discussed the, the investigation of the Battleship Iowa turret explosion investigation where he felt like that they got it wrong and then they went back and, and corrected it later. And he felt it's something of such huge importance. Uh, I, I was a little surprised at that because I didn't think there was a high probability of, of, the, of our getting the physical part wrong. But um, I think on the organizational part, that, that's where it, it, it took some deeper thinking. And that was, to me, an, an extremely good kind of root cause analysis. And he focused on that, really, as being uh, the, mo the most important uh, aspect of the investigation. So Admiral Gaiman, um, he used to use the expression, uh, this investigation isn't over when we uh, find the, the, the broken bracket. Uh, it's like um, in the civil sector sometimes we say that when you find the human error, that's not the end of the investigation. That's the beginning of the investigation. So uh, in the CABE, um, while NASA was hugely focused and did a very good job in helping with the technical part of the investigation, you know, retrieval of wreckage, analysis of data, uh, testing, all that sort of thing uh, on, on the physical side. Um, w uh, really, Gaiman set this direction, uh, even changed the composition of the board to, to focus more on the, on the kind of the historical root causes of this, the culture of the space program, shifting priorities, um, th things like that. Brought in uh, Dr. Logston, who is probably the pre preeminent historian uh, on NASA, and I will say that uh, I think the board members, uh, every one of them, agreed that that this was the more important uh, aspect of the investigation. The, the physical part was important, but it was it was a little it was pretty clean, and um, and as the investigation progressed, that emphasis became stronger and stronger on on those organizational causes. So I, th I think the key takeaway uh, from this investigation is aligns very closely with my key takeaway from spending uh, my entire working life in trying to involved in commercial aviation safety at one level or another, and, and that is that that you, you you can you have to do a better job of of, of seeing the clues in the in the data. Uh, and, and the precursor event. One, one of the last uh, accidents in commercial aviation in, 19, in 2006, I think, uh, Com Air Lexington aircraft ran off the end of the runway, uh, took off on the wrong runway, it was too short, and they went off into the dirt, and 50 people were killed, 49 or 50 people. And the FAA did a very uh, in-depth study of all the data out there on wrong runway departures, and they found 117 of them. So. We'd say, you know, that accident was in the data, and we didn't see it. And um, so um, efforts, efforts nowadays in, to further improve civil aviation's already very good record are focused on doing a better job of mining precursor data, um, letting, not letting anything um, go by that wasn't supposed to happen just because it seemed harmless. It, 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 you got away with it. And um, again, just just deeper uh, mining uh, of the precursor events, and I think that's uh, I think that applies uh, in, in, in any in any safety improvement effort.